All right, so let's do a, an example problem. All right, so let's say that Okay. Someone claims that the uh, average age of a college graduate is 23 years old. All right. So someone who graduates college is 23 years. Um, you decide to test this statement. So you survey, or you uh, randomly select is that mu, the average age, is what? This is the statement that we're trying to test, okay? So is that mu is equal to 23, and the alternative would be then that mu is not, is not 23, okay? We're testing it if the average age is not 23. So from our problem, we need to figure out x bar, s, and n. X bar is the sample average. What's that? 22.4. What is our standard deviation? 2.9. And our n is 26. Okay. So let's get our test statistic. Our test statistic, our t score, is going to be x bar minus mu 0 over s over the square root of n. So here I have. 22.4 minus 23 divided by 2.9 over the square root of 26. So I have negative 0.6 divided by 0 0.569. I get negative 1.055. That is my t score. What is my tail area? What is the tail area associated with negative 1.055? It's the positive number when you look at the chart. Yeah, so you're going to have to go to your t table. How many degrees of freedom do we have? When, when, uh, at 25 degrees of freedom. And I'm looking for the corresponding tail area. So my tail area is what? 2.9. 
So if I shade everything to the right of 1.055, how much do I have shaded? More than 0.100. Okay. So my p value is greater than 20%. Is that okay with everyone? Alright. If I'm using significance level of alpha equal to 0 0.05, is my p value larger or smaller than alpha? So my p value is larger than alpha. So what do we say? We do not reject the null hypothesis. And what does that mean? We don't have enough evidence for what? So when you don't reject the null hypothesis, we would say we do not have evidence to say that the average age of a college grad is not 23 years. Does it prove that the average age of college grad is 23 years? No. It just says we don't have evidence that it's not. So what? We surveyed 26 people, and this is the information we found that doesn't tell us very much. Sample 2, you 
mean x bar 2, s2, and n2. So this is the data you need. As you read a problem, I highly recommend either circling these numbers, or at least in the margin of the problem or somewhere, identifying these six values. It will make the rest of the problem much better. Your test statistic is then calculated. Is equal to x bar 1 minus x bar 2. Sometimes we might say minus zero, but minus zero does nothing, so you can often ignore this. And you divide by the standard error. The standard error, S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. It should look familiar. Can you just log it in? Standard, yes. It was the standard error from a confidence interval. It's always going to be zero. See, it's always the minus zero. But minus zero does nothing, so sometimes we can just ignore this. It's much simpler. Why do the unit have minus zero? Because it's still in the form of what our data showed versus what we expect from the null hypothesis. All right, once you have your test statistic, what do we do next? We find p-value. Yeah, we find the p-value, and how do we do that? By first determining the tails. Yeah, so we look up the t in the t-table. To find the p value. I'm sorry, to find the tail area. Okay. Use degrees of freedom equal to n minus 1 using the smaller n. By the way, this degrees of freedom is n minus 1. That is actually an approximation. There is a true, there is a formula to get the true degrees of freedom, but it's rather complicated and tedious, so we just use n minus 1 as an approximation. If you have a two sided test, what do we do with our tail area? Times it by two months. Yeah. If two sided test, then the p value is double the tail area. If it's a one sided test, the p value is the tail area. If the p value is greater than alpha, do not reject a null. And if the p value is less than alpha, reject a null. It is the same thing. <laughs> the only thing that has changed is that the standard error is right here. Thank you. 
difference between the average weights of the dog and the cat? Sure. Um, of a cat. And uh, let's do a specific breed. Um, Yorkshire Terrier. I'm a golden doodle. Okay, so we gather data. We take. Yeah, Yorkshire Terrier is a small dog. Little puppy. About the size of a little puppy. Okay, we take a sample of 20 random cats, random house cats. What's the average weight? The average weight is. Standard error, 0 0.0. 
Can we try this on our calculator? Not it. Yeah. I'm too fast. I'm too fast. <laughs> <laughs> so my T is what? <laughs> table and what is the tail area? So I have how many degrees of freedom do I have? I use 14 degrees of freedom. What is my tail area? Between 0.025 and 0.01. Tail area mm -hmm. so. is more than our tail which is more than 0.01 off. My tail area 
is between 0 0.025 and 0 0.01? Do I have a one-sided or a two-sided test? Two-sided two test. So my p value is between what and what? 0.025. So I multiply 0.025 times 2, and I would get what? 0.050. 0.050. Is going to be more than my p value, and that's going to be more than 0 0.010 times 2, 0 0.02, or 0 0.02. 0 0.020. Exactly. So I've doubled my tail area to get my p value. So my p value. Let's say my alpha is equal to 0.05. Is my p-value bigger or smaller than alpha? Uh, one of them is, no, yeah, they're it's equal. It's smaller. Smaller. So I don't know the exact value, but I do know my p-value is less than 0.05, but more than 0.02. So I do know my p-value is less than 0.05. So my p-value is smaller than alpha, so we reject so the null hypothesis. <laughs> and what does that mean? We have the evidence that we have evidence that our that the average weight of a cat is different from the average weight of a terrier. Okay, listen up. 
I want to talk about the quiz next week, along with the practice final exam and the study guide. Okay, so this week you have a lot of work to do. Just, it's the last couple weeks. What you want to do is you want to do the homework for this chapter course. Okay. But there's also a practice final exam uh, posted online, along with a study guide. Okay. Uh, you should be able to answer almost everything in the practice final exam except for this one section on sampling, which I'm going to cover next week. Um, if you can get through the practice final exam, I would say you're very well prepared for the quiz also for the final exam. I've print, uh, created a study guide, which is actually more so a strategy guide for solving these types of problems. It lists out kinds of questions that I might ask and how, how to answer them. A lot of it depends on whether the problem deals with categorical variables or numeric variables, whether you have one sample or two samples, whether it's a confidence interval or a hypothesis test. In all of those situations, or every different combination, your strategy for answering the questions is a little bit different. So, in my opinion, the study guide organizes all of that uh, in a way for you to so you know how to answer these questions. Um, if you want to use a study guide, you can use that as a, as a, as a yes. cheat sheet. Yes, so for the final exam, which I'll talk about next week as well, you are allowed a letter sheet of paper with writing on the front and back. If you want to use the study guide as your cheat sheet, that's fine. But you cannot have the study guide and another cheat sheet. Okay. But we'll talk about that later. Yes? What about the practice test? What do you mean? Can we use the practice test as a cheat sheet? If you want to shrink it down so it fits on two pages, I suppose that's allowed. Okay. All right. So let me organize kind of what we've done. All right. So first of all, the most important thing is what kind of problem do you have? You're either dealing with a categorical variable or a numeric variable. So read through the problem and just determine if you're dealing with a categorical variable or a numeric variable. It's very important that we can tell the difference. Like I said, if you finish the course and you cannot tell the difference between a categorical and numeric variable, you probably don't deserve to pass. Categorical variable, you will, deal in, you will be dealing with proportions and use the z-table. No exceptions. Numeric variable, you are dealing with means and you will use the t-table. Always. Okay. The next thing is how many samples do we have? You either have one sample or two. is if you have two samples, you should be able to identify two ends. If you can only identify one end, then you have one sample.
Okay? So let's talk about confidence intervals. So all confidence intervals are in the form of an estimate <laughs> plus or minus a critical value times the standard error. Say you have one sample, but this time it's a numeric variable. So here we have a mean. It's a confidence interval or mu. Oh, actually, let me go back. I apologize. I apologize. At the end, you would say our conclusion is I am blank percent confident that the proportion in, in the population that whatever is between and then you have a lower value That was the last quiz. Yeah, that was what we had on our last quiz, right? I'm blank percent confident that the proportion of adults who do this, play baseball, is between this and that. Okay, so now, mark off, one sample numeric variable is a confidence interval for mu. This time it's going to be x bar plus or minus t star times s over the square root of n. This is our estimate, this is our critical value, this is our standard error. Same thing as before. Estimate, critical value, standard error. Okay. t star comes from the table, comes from t table. Degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. At the end, your conclusion is I am blank percent confident that the 
mean um, of the population.